The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Jesus said to the disciples, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you were not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. Please pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I'm going to go out on a limb today, and I'm going to venture to guess that not one single person in this room likes conflict. Am I I wrong? I'm right, aren't I? Yep. I'm always right. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Ask Pastor Steve. (laughs) Oops, did I start a conflict? (laughs) None of us like conflict. I mean, there are some people that deal with conflict more head-on than others. Um, Some are not afraid to call it out. But even those people don't love conflict. They just face it, right? Um, And people who incite conflict, well, really, if you think about it, they're only doing that because they are feeling conflicted themselves. And this is how they're reaching out to fix or address that issue. So let me say it again, none of us like conflict. And it's how we are wired, I mean, even hardwired. So I'm going to go back to my undergraduate degree in science, and we're going to talk about the body for a second. Because our bodies are a well-oiled machine or system, and actually, if we really get down to it, nine different systems biological systems, all working together in balance to keep us running and performing in the most optimal way as possible. Now, of course, as we get older, it's hard to keep all those systems up and working because they start to wear out. I have a few joints myself that are starting to say, we're not well oiled right now. But even in the young, when something gets out of balance, the rest of the system shifts in order to work to bring the body back to stabilization, to balance, or homeostasis. Big sciencey word. When we're out of balance, we experience what we call disease. But I'm going to slow that word down for you and break it apart the way my pathology instructor did in college. When something is off in the body and things are working, aren't working the way they're supposed to, we call that disease or dis-ease. So lack of ease. The body is in dis-ease and fights to bring back to balance so that all works together as seamlessly as possible again. Dis-ease, when a system is out of balance or in conflict. Now, while our mental and spiritual systems operate very differently, when they are out of balance and in conflict, a person also experiences dis-ease. And all the communities and relationships in our lives that are also little systems, all working and functioning together, hopefully, to work toward good and love and homeostasis. The systems you are a part of in your life are often called the family, or the office, or work, or church, or friend group. And I'm sure you're all part of many more systems that are particular to your own life circumstances as well. So it's with this concept of systems in mind that we're going to talk about today's gospel. But first, I want to get acquainted with where we're at in the bigger story. Over the last few weeks, we've explored the gospel of Matthew through chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16. And all of these chapters have the flow of Jesus' ministry leading up to the point of the transfiguration in chapter 17. They're all parables and healing stories and declarations that show the people who Christ is, what Christ has come to do, 
and in some ways to build faith or even show the faith of others. Some have strong faith, some stumbling faith, some have shown unexpected faith. But as Pastor Steve mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we skip the transfiguration story right now. We'll get to it later in the church here, but we skip that. But it's this amazing story of Peter and James and John going up the mountain with Jesus. At this ministry, everything has been building, moving upward, moving forward and upward in this motion, upwards up the mountains. And now here they are at the mountaintops with the transfiguration. And Peter's like, this is awesome. Let's stay here. And Jesus says, sorry, we can't. We got to go back down. And so then from this point on, Jesus' ministry shifts, and he begins this descent downward and this movement towards his death. And so because of that, this becomes a new time of teaching. If you're familiar with your Gospel of Matthew, the beginning, especially 5, 6, and 7, chapters 5, 6, 6 and 7, that's the Sermon on the Mount, and he spends a lot of time teaching. And then we have this section where he does all these miracles and healings and does share some parables too, teaches too, but it's all these actions that Christ has come to do. And so now in 18, we're returning to a time of teaching the things that Jesus wants to say before he goes to meet his death. He's preparing the disciples and followers for that time and help them learn how to live and what to expect in the future. And so it's in this context that Jesus shares in chapter 18 some words about the temptation to sin, the fact that even when we sin, God seeks us out and forgives us, even if it's just one among a hundred, and then God sets the tone for how we can keep each other accountable to each other in the flock. So let's walk through the verses of chapter 18 briefly. Verses 1 through 5 talk about who has true greatness. So Jesus says, those who become childlike or humble themselves are truly great. And then verses 6 through 9 talk about, however, there's this temptation of sin and then the personal accountability or what to do so that you don't sin, what would be better to do instead of sinning. And then in verses 10 through 14, Jesus reassures us that when we sin and become lost, God seeks us out and finds us in this particular parable that's finding one sheep in a flock of 100 and then finally, in verses 15 through 20, Jesus teaches us how to reconcile with someone or keep each other accountable for Christian love and relationship when there's conflict and sin. And then immediately after, Jesus teaches Peter about forgiveness, not seven times, but forgive 77 times. So even if someone continues to sin against you and you reproach them in the way laid out in verses 15 through 20, it's still important to forgive. So treating them, as it says in those uh, 15 through 20, like a Gentile or a tax collector, that means that doesn't mean just you don't have to forgive them. It means that maybe you remove yourself a little bit, but you continue to forgive. Not seven, but 77 times. So today, I want to spend a little bit of time, a little more time, talking about 15 through 20 in the context of relationship and community or God's flock and what it means that this is also a system. And so what do we know about systems? When something is off, there is dis-ease. And I'd even go so far to postulate that the larger the system, the greater the probability for conflict or disease. So here comes conflict and disease. What we haven't talked about is the way a system handles that when it happens. The physical body has its optimal way of working back to homeostasis, but often, due to a, a number of different possible circumstances, it might not work so seamlessly, and it might do other things that are actually bringing more disease and only stabilize and not reconcile the original issue or maybe create other issues. Systems might shut down to work on the problem only to cause other problems. I use the example of my father-in-law who had a liver transplant many years ago and they had to put him on medication so that his body wouldn't reject the liver. But then there are parts of his body that didn't like that medication so they had to give him medications to fix what those medications were doing. And then they had to give him medications to balance those medications. And there was a lot of medications for a while. Sometimes the disease might be so big in a normal situation 
that the issue ends up causing greater harm. And so this is the same way it is with communities or relational systems. And this is what Jesus speaks to us about in verses 15 through 20. When a person experiences conflict, there are a number of ways we may react or respond. Some become volatile and outwardly angry. Some retreat and just don't speak. Some tiptoe around or deny or manipulate the conflict to try not to deal with it or to soften it a little bit. And some may even ask someone else to resolve the conflict for them, which often results in what we would call a triangle, and that's a whole other day's conversation, but that often causes more harm and doesn't solve the issue. The point is, however, that these responses as natural and normal and as learned as they are to each one of us, they can often lead to greater harm while not solving the original issue of disease, and in some cases, creating even more. So Jesus leaves us in this gospel story with a way to respond in an optimal way to bring the system back into loving relationship. As Paul writes in Romans today, all that we do, our obligation as Christians in order to truly fulfill God's law, all that we do should be done in the scope of loving our neighbor and loving God. This is how we fulfill the law. This is how Christ showed us to fulfill the law. And in this particular case of conflict, loving the neighbor is restoring relationship and reconciling. So Jesus tells us that we are to face the person we have conflict with, optimally in a way that's loving and works to help them see what you are seeing or hearing or needing, maybe recognizes where they're coming from. It helps them hear how they may have offended you or hurt you, and you're to do it in private so as not to shame them or embarrass them, but to keep the conflict where it belongs, right there between the two of you. And if this doesn't work, because as we know, in many cases, we're human and we're not perfect and our feelings get in the way, or maybe we misunderstand and our language is a little different, it's so hard to communicate well sometimes and we can't necessarily hear each other. So in these cases, we're to bring someone else along with us. In verse 16, it says, But if you're not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So this isn't to gang up against someone. It's not to, it's not to refuse to listen to the other person. In fact, it's in the spirit of keeping that conversation loving and having someone there to help maybe interpret or help you understand each other, serving as a facilitator, maybe even validating each person. Like in the story of the orange, the two girls weren't listening to each other. And so it would have been really helpful if the dad, instead of coming and becoming part of the conflict, had come in and said, what is it that you both need? And help them to find a win-win. But if this doesn't work, and no one refuses to listen, then you bring in the whole community. If you're in conflict with someone, and you bring your hurt and forgiveness to them in a healthy and loving way, and then you have to do that with a small group of people, and it still doesn't work, the idea is that perhaps the whole community needs to show support and concern for reconciliation and to help that happen. And then finally, Christ ends this lesson with words that where two or more are gathered in my name, I am there among them. We have often misused the context of this verse in a more broad sense of Christ's presence when we gather, and of course we do recognize that Christ is present with us any time we gather. But in context here, this is a reminder that in all our reconciliation, in all our conflict, in all of our conversation with each other, Christ is present with us there also. So it makes me wonder, would I or would you handle conflict differently if you reminded yourself that Christ is right there with you and that other person in that very moment. Because Christ is a part of our reconciliation, and Christ reminds us that reconciliation should be done in love and because of love. So in our world, there are systems all around us, relationships everywhere for us, and systems are tricky. They're tricky things. There are many ways that conflict and disease can erupt. 
And in most cases, handling it in love will shift the system right back into relationship and reconcile. But sometimes it takes a bit more. Here's the good news, though, in all of this conflict. Christ teaches us how to reconcile in love and actually reconciles all of us in God's love. Christ is loving us in the midst of reconciliation. We are not alone, but we're always part of a family in baptism. And hopefully it's that system and balance that works together for good. God's work, our hands. Amen.